Welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. Did John MacArthur lie about the gospel when he was on the Ben Shapiro show last Sunday? That's what we're going to talk about in this video. Recently, John MacArthur was on the Ben Shapiro show, and the Ben Shapiro show, every Sunday they do a special where they have a guest on. I've actually come to enjoy these. Some of the guests they have on there are pretty interesting to listen to. I've uh, read some of the books by some of the authors that he's had on there, so it's been pretty interesting. So when John MacArthur was coming on there, you know, on this channel we do a lot of stuff on Calvinism, and John MacArthur is a famous Calvinist, so I thought this would be a great opportunity to sit and listen and see what this guy has to say. So I subscribed to the podcast, and I was listening to it on audio, and then I went and got the video later. We're going to look at a couple of video clips. Mainly what this centers around, when it comes to giving the gospel, I'm going to, I'm going to presume that John MacArthur, I, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt here. He's, he's a Calvinist, and I think he's wrong on a whole lot of things. But a lot of Christian celebrities, if you will, when they get asked about, say, slavery and homosexuality and stuff like that, they back down. They give some kind of... Uh, some kind of watered down answer and, and John MacArthur really didn't do that. Now he did present Calvinism, so I'm not too happy about that, but on, but on the other typical, the social stuff, he didn't back down. I think that's good. I think that's good that a Christian celebrity would come out and not back down on stuff like that. So that was good. So our, our main focus here is dealing with the issue of limited atonement. In Calvinism there is five major points that they usually get talked about the tulip, the total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And the, the issue here is limited atonement. Now, the reason this catches my attention is because when, when a Calvinist has an opportunity to present the gospel, I'm always curious how they're going to phrase how sin is handled. Because with limited atonement, the belief is that Jesus did not die for the sins of everybody, Oh, and, there, and there's a spectrum. You know, there's some people even call themselves four-point Calvinists and they don't believe in the L of the tulip. I'm talking about five-point Calvinists who believe in limited atonement. But even in those who do believe in the L and limited atonement, there's, there's, a, there's a wide variety. Some of them are, are like Beza and God's Chalk where like the atonement was only sufficient or efficient for anybody. And some of them are uh, more like Calvin. <laughs> You know, Augustine, limited atonement wasn't a thing with Augustine. It, the, the syllogism hadn't made it that far yet with Augustine where Calvinism started with his Manichaean Gnosticism. The limited atonement came later, a little bit in the 5th century, and then mainly with God's chalk in the early 9th century. And that strong limited atonement is that uh, it wasn't sufficient or efficient for all. It was only sufficient and efficient to save just the elect. And so, uh, if you look at John MacArthur's comments, he's obviously a sufficient for all, but only efficient for the elect. He's a, he's a Lombardi type, limited atonement kind of Calvinist, okay? We're going to look at what his limited atonement stance is from his, from his own words, from things he's said and things he's written. And then we're going to compare it with what he says in the Ben Shapiro show. My first take on listening to this, when, when I heard him on the show, was that Probably higher than 90% of what he said, well, I don't know about 90%, but a lot of the things that he said, I would agree with. I, I would sign my name to a lot of the stuff that he said. And then there's, of course, a lot of stuff that I wouldn't. But he, he didn't come out blazing Calvinist guns. He, he's not, he, uh, he refuted supersessionism, replacement theology. So, so he said some good things. He said some good things culturally for a Christian as well. So on this issue of limited atonement, that's where my ears perk up and that's what I want to see what he has to say. So we look at some of the things that John MacArthur, just to look at his stance on limited atonement. I want to make one thing clear about this sufficiency efficiency argument. It's, it's very cleverly worded, it's deceptive, and it gets a lot of non-Calvinists to kind of agree to it. But the problem with it is that it's, it's false. It's based on a false assumption that the atonement saves. So when people start saying, you know, sufficient or efficient, stop, stop the show and start asking the question, sufficient or efficient to do what? To do what exactly? Well, to save, right? 
That's the implication. But no, nothing ever says that Christ's death saved anybody. Now, you can't be saved without it. Don't get me wrong. People always want to run away with that one. <clears throat> but you can't show me where Christ's death was efficient to save anybody, especially in 2018. You can't show me that. You know why? Because we shall be saved by his life, Romans 5, 10. <laughs> the death isn't what's saved. We're saved by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, Titus 3, 5. That's what we're saved by. That's made possible by the death of Christ, but that is not what's saved. So all, all the limited atonement arguments, I don't care who they're from, Calvinists and non-Calvinists, they all make the mistake of thinking the atonement saves, thinking it does something salvific for people. And it is, it is not the saving element. The washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost is the saving element. The life of Christ is the saving element. None of that would be possible without the death. We need the death. We need the shed blood, justified by faith in his blood. I got it. You got to have all that stuff. But the completion of your salvation is not possible with, uh, without the regeneration. No, but nothing ever says that we're saved by his death, okay? So we want to get those arguments straight. It's, it's like a, the sufficiency, efficiency argument is like that joke where people said, where people say, is it correct to say the egg yolks is white or the egg yolks are white? Well, the egg yolks are white. <laughs> so the, the problem isn't with the is or the are, the problem is with the color. And that's what people do, that's what Calvinists do to deflect from the real issue. Um, sufficient or efficient to do, that's not the argument. Sufficient or efficient is not the argument. To do what? That's the argument. And then, and then the follow-on question is, what is it that saves? And the atonement is not it. So you gotta bear that in mind. So we look at John MacArthur's comments, and I'm taking for granted that everybody pretty much understands that John MacArthur is a Calvinist. He does believe in limited atonement. He says, all those indicate to us that there is an unlimited aspect to Christ's work on the cross, but when you talk of substitution, you are now, you are talking about the limited aspect of it. He believes that the, the atonement creates some kind of common grace for everybody, make a better life for everybody on earth, but substitutionarily for the punishment of sin, it only applies to the elect. That's his position on that. In the next paragraph, and, and I have this documentation on these slides, you can pause the screen or get the slides off the website to get, if you wanna go look this stuff up, you can go look this stuff up. And the website's at the bottom of the slide as well. So you can look that stuff up. In the next paragraph, he is the substitute only for those who believe, okay? Exclusively for those who believe. If in fact he was carrying himself on the cross as a substitute for the sins of every person who ever lived, he would therefore have done away with the wrath of God and procured for them eternal life, and we would all be universalists. No, that makes the mistake of thinking that the atonement saves, and that the atonement doesn't save. And Calvinists drawing this universal, they jump straight to universalism because they're confused about basic soteriology and they don't know what it is that saves. That's the problem. Down here in the last paragraph, he did not die. This is John MacArthur's words. He did not die as a substitute taking away the sin of people who don't believe in him or he would have procured salvation for them and for everybody who would be saved. That's again, confusion about what saves. Taking away somebody's sin does not save them. Sa salvation, if you look in Romans, salvation, uh, there's two parts to it. You got to have your sin taken care of, Romans 3, 23. And then there's a glory part to it and it falls short of the glory of God. Taking your sin away does not glorify you. Glorification comes by other means, other than having your sin taken away. It's a separate process. There's two things that have to happen. Sin take away and glorification. Glorification does not get discussed in Romans till, the book, till chapter 8. And no Calvinist knows that because no Calvinist believes the Bible. Otherwise, they wouldn't be a Calvinist. So in the substitutionary sense, he bore only the sins of those who ultimately would put their faith in him. Notice that word only, so that's exclusive. Who put their faith in him because they were his. So he believes in this limited atonement exclusively for the elect. Elsewhere, MacArthur says, did Christ actually pay the penalty for everyone's sins? And, and if he did pay the penalty for everyone's sins, then the suffering for sin was already accomplished. How in the world could someone have to suffer eternally for their sin if, sins, if sinners are sent to hell to pay for their sins? Their sins could not have been paid for by Christ on the cross. So he's making this argument, that it's, it's, the, it's the double jeopardy argument. And I'll, I'll, I always challenge a Calvinist to show me, why don't you show me anywhere in the Bible where somebody goes to hell to pay for their sins? Just show me that one. What is this, purgatory now? Can you get out with indulgences? <laughs> what are you talking, why do they think this? Okay, why do you think you can go to hell and pay for your sins? Who does that? Where is that, where is that found in your Bible? 
Okay? But anyway, the idea of Christ paying for sins, he, he, he's bolstering his argument that Christ only pays for some people, only the elect sins. The actual atonement was made only for those who would believe, is what he says. Only their sins were expiated, otherwise nobody could go to hell if Christ bore the punishment of their sins. There would be no sin for them to be punished for. Okay, there it is again. Double jeopardy argument. And again, they fail, they fail to understand that people aren't going to hell for sin. They're not going to hell for the sin of unbelief. They go to hell for unbelief because faith is the point of access to the grace. That's why. It's not because they're being punished for unbelief, but it's because belief in Christ is the path. That's the only way. And if you don't take that way, you don't go to glory. That's, that's why. He goes on. When Christ died, he actually paid the penalty for the sins of those who God had designed to belong to him. The focus and attention of the actual atonement of Christ, the actual expiation, the actual sin bearing was in behalf of those who would believe. The actual payment, however, was limited to those who believe. Those names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world, all that stuff. Now, we've got a video on the Lamb's Book of Life, stuff like that. Anyway, the, the point here, he's, he's, a, he's a limited atonement Calvinist, okay? Commenting on 2 Corinthians 5.21, MacArthur says, God treated him as if he had personally committed every sin ever committed by every person who would ever believe and punished him for them all, though in reality he had never committed one. That's substitution. God treated Jesus as if he had committed every sin ever committed by every person who would ever believe. So it's limited to those who would believe. And then you, now watch out for that because you're going to see that again in the video and I'll show it to you. And then he took the penalty for all those sins and just crushed the life of Jesus out with his wrath. Okay. In his commentary on John, he says Christ procured salvation for all whom God would call and justify. He actually paid the penalty in full for all who ever believe Sinners do not limit the atonement by their lack of faith. God does by his sovereign design. All right, so God limits, so limited atonement. Now, he, he likes to actually call it actual atonement. So, you know, they're always playing word games, you know. They don't want to come across as making God seem limited. <laughs> so they, they try to play around with these words, kind of like in political correctness, how you're not allowed to use some words anymore because they get a neg negative stigma on them. So you got to change the terminology. Calvinists are always doing this too. All right, there is a link there. In the MacArthur Study Bible, MacArthur says, most of the world will be eternally condemned to hell to pay for their own sins. There's no, no passage that ever says anybody pays for their own sins, by the way. So they could not have been paid for by Christ. Okay, and then he says, only for those who believe. All right, that's the atonement was made only for those who believe. Limited atonement. By all who would ever believe is the next. For believers' sins on the cross. The actual atonement is sufficient Notice it says sufficient, the sufficiency efficiency argument coming out here. So he's a Lombardi. Actual atonement sufficient for the sins of the whole world was made for all who would ever believe, namely the elect. So this is limited to the elect. For whom the actual atonement was made. Not all will be ransomed, but only the many who believe by the work of the Holy Spirit and for whom the actual atonement was made. Which means the atonement was not made for all. Alright, limited atonement. He died his death and bore his sin. The substitutionary aspect of the death is applied to the elect alone. That's his comments on 1 Timothy 2.6. So that is limited atonement. God treated him as if he had committed every sin ever committed by every person who would ever believe. That's comments on Isaiah 53. In his own 1 Timothy 4, MacArthur explains how Christ's death benefits the non-elect only in a temporal sense, but Christ died as a substitute only for believers. So it should be pretty clear that John, uh, John MacArthur is a limited atonement Calvinist. He does not believe that Christ, died, Christ paid for the sins of the non-elect. All right? Now, I want you to pay attention to what he says here. In this clip, John MacArthur is going to say, Jesus Christ is the Savior who has provided a way for you. He's talking to Ben Shapiro. He's talking to Ben Shapiro. And he says, this is my initial goal, to tell you that you are without God in the world, that there is one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you are in sin, that sin brings death and punishment. But the good news is that Jesus Christ is the Savior who has provided a way for you to be forgiven by bearing your sins in his body on the tree so that God's justice is satisfied and his love can be extended to you by putting your trust in Christ. Now, when he says this, He's talking to Ben Shapiro, who is not saved. He is a Jew and does not believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. But he's also 
putting this forth as the gospel that is told to lost people. In the context here, it, he's in the middle of discussing homosexuality and how homosexuality is a sin. And then he gets into the, the whole purpose of the Christian message to confront the sinner. So he's kind of talking abstractly and he's talking to Ben Shapiro at the same time. But this, this stands out to me, this you. Now listen for yourself and listen for him to say, you bear your sins. He, he gives the person who does not believe hope that their sins were born on Christ's body. So listen. The whole purpose of the Christian message is to confront the sinner's sin so you can call the sinner to repentance and forgiveness. The sinner doesn't like that. Uh, we, we had a question on the, on the little questionnaire that you, your people sent me. Mm -hmm. It said, do you feel like you might be offending Democrats with some of the things you say? And my response to that is, look, my goal is to offend everyone. <laughs> 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 that is my initial goal, to tell you that you are without God in the world, that there's only one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, um, that you're in sin, that sin brings death and punishment, but the good news is Jesus Christ is the Savior who has provided a way for you to be forgiven by bearing your sins in his body on the tree so that God's justice is satisfied and his love can be extended to you by putting your trust in Christ. So this really stood out to me to hear John MacArthur say that Jesus Christ is the Savior who has provided a way for you to be forgiven. How could you say that to somebody who, if you don't know that they're elect? Now, Ben Shapiro or whoever you're talking to, whoever you're saying that to, if they're not elect, they do not have a way provided for them to be forgiven. And when he says, bearing your sins in his body, well, Christ did not pay for the sins of non elect according to his belief. So why would he say that? And, and, and when I say, why would he say that? I'm not trying to single out John MacArthur, but do, do Calvinists talk this way? Is this expected of Calvinists? And theologically, like when you're writing or preaching or in your study Bible or in your commentaries, you're like, Christ did not pay for the sins of the non elect, but when I'm talking to an, an individual, I don't know if they're elect or not, because they're still alive, maybe they'll believe later, right? I don't know if they're elect or not, but I'm going to tell them that God has provided a way for you to be forgiven. Now, is that lying to them? Is that giving them false hope if you don't believe that that might be the case? Is it giving them false hope to say, has forgiven you by bearing your sins in his body? Now, if, if, uh, if Ben Shapiro dies tomorrow without receiving Jesus Christ, John MacArthur is, you know, God, for, I'm not wishing death on anybody. Don't get me wrong. I'm just speaking hypothetically. But if, if that were to happen, John MacArthur would not think that Christ bore his sins on his body, on the tree. So is, is this dis... I, to, now, I'm just saying, to me, this is dishonesty. I, th I think a Calvinist who believes what John MacArthur clearly believes when they're giving the gospel, if you want to call it the gospel, it should be like, Christ died and rose again. He died to pay for the sins of the elect. We don't know if you're the elect or not. If you are, that's good news for you. If you're not, not so good news for you. All right. So, but we're going to sit around to see if it takes. <laughs> that's if you're honest. If you were an honest Calvinist who really believed in limited atonement, you wouldn't be telling people that Christ bore their sins, that they have a path to forgiveness, because the majority of the time, chances are that they wouldn't. He says, so that God's justice is satisfied and his love can be extended to you by you putting, now that second you there, I think he stumbles past it, but by you putting your trust in Christ. Now that doesn't sound Calvinistic. Put your trust in Christ? How about you be given the gift of faith? I didn't think you had any trust to put into Christ. So I'm not going to make a big issue about that. In some of this, maybe it's... Maybe if he could go back and say it again, he wouldn't say it this way. I don't know. I don't know. But, w but when you make the call, when you, you know, I beseech you by God, be ye reconciled to God, what, what do you tell people? What do Calvinists tell people? Is, it, is this how they, are they... Do they talk like John MacArthur talks here? Or... <laughs> And, and I'm saying, yes, they do. I mean, quite, quite regularly, they, they very easily just lie through their false teeth to people on a regular basis. 
saying one thing to a sinner's face and then saying something else in their theology and their commentary. And the, and the theology and what they tell people with their mouth do not match. And this, this is routine. Now let's watch the next clip. And what I want to point out here is John MacArthur says a phrase that's interesting to me. He says, the way to God is open. There's no more barriers because, it's a, suitable because a suitable sacrifice has been found. Listen to this clip. You have this most amazing thing. You come to the death of Jesus Christ. And at the death of Christ, the veil in the temple is rent. From top to bottom, the Holy of Holies is thrown open. Wow, that's a statement from God because it couldn't have been ripped by men from the top down. The way to God is open. There's no more barriers because a, a suitable sacrifice has been found. This is the Lamb of God. And amazingly, soon after that, the whole sacrificial system ends. Okay, so the context here is that John MacArthur is talking about the death of Christ. He's talking about the temple, the temple being rent and... When he says there's no more barrier, the context of what he's saying is there's no, the temple being rent in twain. We no longer have to go through the, the temple system, the sacrificial system, because, you know, just Christ just ripped that wide open. Now we go to God straight through Jesus Christ. No more barrier. All right. No more veil in the temple. I got that. But this phrase, when he says the way to God is open, there's no more barriers because a suitable sacrifice has been found. Now, te technically, that's not true. Technically, there's, there's the barrier of not being elect. If you're a Calvinist, if Calvinism is true, most people have a huge barrier. And that barrier is that they're not elect. So Christ dying is not good news for them because Christ didn't die for them. Their sins aren't paid for. And that, that's why I say Calvin, uh, Calvinism has no gospel. Because it's not good news. If, if you are elect, the good news is that you're elect. The good news isn't that Christ died for you. That's just peripheral. That's just something that comes along with the package. The, the real decisive factor is whether or not you're elect. That's what determines whether or not Christ dies for your sins. If you're not elect, there's no good news. There is no Savior. You know, in the previous clip, he says there's only one and only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not if you're not elect. There's no savior if you're not elect. Your, your goose is cooked. So that, that's another glaring contradiction to me in Calvinist theology and then what they say out of their mouth when they're talking to somebody. Now we're going to watch another clip. What we're going to listen to in this clip is that John MacArthur here, while he's still talking to Ben Shapiro, he goes, he goes back to his theology. Now we looked at his theological statements that he wrote uh, or that he said while he was preaching, when he was speaking in public, in his study Bible and in his commentaries. He's going to say things like, all the people who will ever believe throughout human history, their sins are covered by Christ. He bears in his body all the sins of who would ever believe through human history. And then to all who believe. So he started off by saying, you have a, have a, have a provision for your sins to be forgiven and Christ bore your sins. He starts off saying that. And then he kind of changes his tune. I don't know if he's like uh, correcting himself without correcting himself. So he does go back. I mean, maybe he didn't mean to say it that way the first time. So he goes back to his theology here. Listen to this clip. The one sacrifice, the writer of Hebrews says, he perfected forever those that are sanctified by his one offering. He was God's lamb, uh, a spotless lamb without blemish. God put on him the sins of us all. This is a stunning theological truth because all the people who will ever believe through human history their sins are covered by Christ. Even those who believed going back to Adam, they were, all of them ha had to have a sacrifice that paid the price for their sins, whether it happened before Christ, their belief, or after Christ. Christ is the focal point. So he bears in his body all the sins of all who would ever believe through human history. This is a stunning thing to think about. Um, God putting all the sin and all the punishment on him. People say, well, how could one person bear that? Um, the answer is because he's, 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 he's a cosmic person. He's, he's an eternal being. He's, he's vast beyond us with a capacity to take that punishment. So he gathers up all the punishment for all the sins of all the people because sin must be punished. God is holy. And uh, that frees God, satisfying his justice to offer grace to all who believe in him. In that clip, he said, God put on him the sins of us all. This is a stunning theological truth because 
all the people who, are, who will ever believe through human history, their sins are covered by Christ. Now, Ben Shapiro, he, he hasn't believed yet, and as far as we can tell, he's probably not going to, so I guess his sins aren't covered by Christ. If he never believes, his sins aren't covered by Christ. He says, so he bears in his body all the sins of all who would ever believe through human history. Well, he just got through saying that Christ bore your sins on his body on the tree. Which one of these is true? Because the person he was talking to isn't a believer. It probably isn't going to be. Not that I wish that. You know, I hope he does. But I'm pointing out what is being said here. And that frees God, satisfying his justice to offer grace to all who believe in him. So he doesn't offer grace to those who don't believe in him. I thought irresistible grace forced people to believe in him. <laughs> so so we, could, we could deal with the... Uh, irresistible grace issue another time but here but here obviously the limited atonement comes back out in full force having seen macarthur's views and having seen how he talks in an interview with ben shapiro who was a lost jew i just want to ask a few questions was macarthur lying when he said jesus christ is the savior who has provided a way for you to be forgiven by by bearing your sins in his body on the tree was he lying because that disagrees that either takes a bet that maybe the person he's talking to is one of the elect, but that disagrees with his theology. You wouldn't say that to a non-believer because you don't know if Christ bore their sins on his body on the tree. So should Calvinists doctor that up and police that up and not talk that way? Should they really talk about what they believe? Christ bore some sins on, the, on, the, on his body on the tree and they might be yours. Might not be, but might be, you know. Come over here and buy a lottery ticket. Maybe it'll be you. Now, regarding this statement that Christ has provided a way for you to be forgiven, bearing your sins on his body on a tree, talking to a lost person or to lost people, would Calvinists consider that statement, talking that way, to be unfaithful to Calvinism? I, I suspect that most Calvinists would be okay with it. They would act like, hey, there's nothing to see here. You know, no big deal. What's the big problem there? If a person were to believe that upon trusting Christ, now say they're lost and they believe a, Ca a Calvinist like John MacArthur who says the Savior has provided a way for you to be forgiven by bearing your sins on his body on a tree. If a Calvinist believes that Christ bore my sins on the body of the tree and then trusts Christ because of that, would a Calvinist think that that person was really saved? I mean, can, can you think something that you can't know to be true and then be saved based off that thing? Now, what if the person later, let's, let's presume they, they get saved or have a conversion experience. Let's say that later they learn, you know, that Christ might have, in fact, not died for them. What then? Are they saved then? Well, back when I, back when I became a Christian, I thought that, you know, there, I, the Savior provided a way for me to be forgiven and bore my sins on the body on the tree. But now... None of the passages that say all over your world are telling the truth, so I don't know whether it's for me or not. So uh, I, I don't know if I can trust it. But what then? What do they do then? When MacArthur says all who believe, all who believe what? That Christ died and rose again? Even the devils believe and tremble. Or believe in a sense of trust. That trust, to trust Christ to forgive their sin, which might not have been covered because they might not be the elect. How can you trust a Christ who might not have died for your sins? So believe what? what? Tell me what I'm supposed to believe here. I know what we're supposed to believe, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's what, that's what Paul says. And that's, the, that's what we're supposed to preach to lost people. And the hour is me and you, lost guy. Christ died for our sins. Now, I know what we're supposed to believe, but when a Calvinist says that those who believe, believe what? Just, just the historical fact that Christ died and rose again, and that maybe it was for them, maybe it wasn't? Where's the trust? How can you trust somebody if you don't know they died for your sins? And then among all the Calvinists out there that believe in limited atonement, how much variance is there among Calvinists in how they preach the gospel and how they word things like this? I mean, do Calvinists go around telling people that Christ died for their sins? Their sins were covered on the cross? Do you tell people that if you're a Calvinist? Do Calvinists routinely tell people that Christ bore their sins or that there's a way for them to be forgiven? 
So with this in mind, if you're a Calvinist watching this, I want to set my expectation at a reasonable place. I just, I just want you to understand. Can you understand the perceived dissonance and hypocrisy that some of us non-Calvinists see with this presentation? Can you understand it? How can you tell somebody Christ died for them or bore their sins on the tree when you don't really have an authority that says he did? How, how do you do that? So to, to us, non-Calvinists, that's hypocrisy. I can tell somebody that Christ died for them because when 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15 says that he died for all, I believe that. I believe that's me and everybody. So I can say it to anybody I encounter, I can tell them Christ died for them. Does a Calvinist do that? When it says Christ gave himself a ransom for all, I believe that. When it says he tasted death for every man, I believe that. When he says he is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I believe that. Okay? So I can tell people that Christ died. So can you understand, Calvinist, that if you don't think those verses are true, what do you tell people? And is, does what you tell people match what you believe? I'd venture a guess that it doesn't. Now how honest is that? What, what spirit is inside you that makes you okay with that kind of hypocrisy and deceit and lying? You know, it's kind of like Mormons have Planet Kolob, where you can go up there and your wife can be eternally pregnant making spirit babies. But you don't learn that right away because that's crazy stuff. You have, to, you have to be a Mormon for a little while before they teach you that stuff. And that, that's how Calvinism is. You don't start people off on the Calvinism. You start people off... On, on a gospel that I would preach, and then you wean them off of that later, once you got them. Yeah, we know how it goes. Here's some more questions. How can a person have assurance of salvation if you can't even know whether Christ died for you or bore your sins? Are you saved? Yeah, did Christ die for you? I don't know. <laughs> if a person does claim to be a believer, how would the person know that they have real grace and not evanescent grace. You know, Calvinists have this thing called evanescent grace where some people think they're saved, but they're really not. Maybe, maybe that was Derek Webb for a while. You know, the lead man for Caveman's Call comes out and says he's an atheist now. Was that evanescent grace? So how would you know the difference? When you spend all, you don't, you don't have any author, anything authoritative in the Bible telling you that Christ died for you. So how would you know that he did? There is no passage you can point to in Scripture that says Christ died for you. So since Calvinists don't believe any of the passages that say all every world, what evidence do they have that they are saved apart from their own works and experience? You ask the Calvinists how they know they're saved? They have to point to their works and experience. They have nothing in Scripture they can point to. If you ask me how I know I'm saved, what I'm going to say... First of all, I know Christ died for me. Why? Because it says he died for all. He tasted death for every man. He gave himself a ransom for all. And he is a propitiation for the sins of the whole world. I know Christ died for me. I know my sins are covered on the cross and in the resurrection. I know that. A Calvinist cannot know that. They have no authoritative document that says it. So where do they have to look? They have to look to their own works and experience. You say, no, I don't because I just believe. Yeah, that's your experience. That's your works. Well, I, yeah, that's your works and your experience. But uh, yes, that's your works and your experience. I'm telling you, Calvinists have no way to have assurance apart from their own works and experience. I have the witness of the Holy Spirit within me. That's your experience. You see, you have no authority, do you? You have no objective authority. You're just out there flapping. The reciprocal question to that would be, what is the evidence to a Calvinist that they aren't excluded? In other words, not elect, apart from their own works and experience. How do you know you're not one of the non-elect? How do you know you're not one of the reprobate? Well, I had a conversion experience. Well, I felt irresistible grace, you know, bring faith to me, that kind of thing. That's an experience. That's a works. You have, you have nothing authoritative from God, do you? No, you don't. Scripture has to be the authority. And the problem with Calvinism, it's not sovereignty, 
It's not free will. It's not foreknowledge. None of that stuff. None of that stuff. It is failure to believe in scriptural authority. That is the one and only problem with a Calvinist. And that's why no Calvinist can ever have assurance of their salvation without looking to themselves. It is the most man-centered and man-exalting philosophy and theology on the planet. Calvinism is. You have to look to yourself. Practically, you have to look to yourself. You spend your whole life committing the no true Scotsman fallacy and relying on that for your salvation. Well, you better give it up. You better repent. You better trust God for a change and believe that maybe he can piece two or three sentences together without a Calvinist help telling him what he's really supposed to say. Trust God for a change. Repent of your Calvinism. Trust Christ. Experience the spirit that doesn't lead you to have to lie to people when you're telling them that Christ did die for them, Christ did bear their sins on his body on the tree, and you don't have to worry about that conflicting with any theology because that's what the scripture says. He died for all. He's the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. So that's the end of the video. Remember to share. You can email me. You go to our website. All that stuff. All that good stuff. So thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.